happens to us in life, but we do get to choose what we make of it. And tonight, we invite you to make the declaration with us that you will say, yes, I will choose to glorify the Lord in whatever situation I find myself in. Sing with us, yes, I will. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails, will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Never fails, will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, oh yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you and we ask you to help us keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, when so many other things would want to distract us, would want to steal our attention, would want to steal our affection, Lord, I pray that you help us to keep our minds stayed on you and uh, that we would find perfect peace in and through you. In your son's precious name we pray, amen. All right, you can um, take your worksheet that um, we made available uh, to, for you to kind of follow along in a lesson. I some time ago finished our series, not too long ago, in the book of Judges and had not yet settled into um, a series, a new series for Wednesday night, and um, probably would have been by now. But uh, what, what now I feel led to do is just keep this midweek time open to give myself liberty to speak along the lines of um, a challenge for each of us in times like this and encouragement. Last week we talked about fear and uh, our response to fear. And so uh, what I want to do tonight is talk about the power to choose and ask the question, what will you choose today? And um, we're going to base that out of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. So you can um, get there in your Bible, uh, Deuteronomy 30, 15 through 20. We'll talk through these verses and move through the admonition uh, that we have here. So first thing is this, that in the Bible, look at this, in the Bible there are more than 200 references to the word choose. Now, it's different forms, uh, just like fear, you know, when it comes to fear. There's uh, 365 fear knots or statements about fear. It says it different ways, but uh, there are 200 references to the word choose. And as we're presently in this pandemic that, that clouds our nation, uh, we're very well aware that every voice of authority is constantly telling us, make good choices. And uh, there's even been a few in our nation that have been highlighted, highlighted on national news that are, uh, are not making good choices. Well, although materialists have attempted to explain away, and it's, it's hard for them to do, uh, humanity's ability to make choices, all kinds of choices, all kinds of decisions in life, it remains as one of the greatest proof of God's existence. Um, truly, the choices we make, especially those that are of the spiritual, moral nature, well, they serve to remind us that uh, we're made in God's image. When we talk about being bearing God's image, there's a, there's a deep chasm there, and it could, we could talk about a lot of things. What does it mean that when God came there to mankind, that he made us different than the rest of creation? Well, he, he, we bear his likeness and image. He, we are the object of his personal creative attention. I believe the height of his creative efforts. And then he breathed into us his own breath. And, and so with God's image certainly comes volition or the ability to choose. Now in the beginning, God uh, placed Adam and Eve in a position where they, uh, like God who chose to become flesh in the form of Jesus Christ, they had the ability to choose. It's the first evidence of that. We see that right there in the garden. And we're all familiar with that account there in Genesis chapter 3. And we know that Adam and Eve, uh, and they made poor choice by eating the forbidden fruit for which God held them both accountable. So right there in the, in the very get-go of Genesis chapter 3, that yes, we're able to make decisions and choices in God's image, but we're also accountable for the choices that we make. And perhaps the reason people are more drawn, and I believe this is so, to a materialistic, theistic worldview, 
and deny the existence of God. The reason perhaps they're drawn there is to avoid accountability, you see. And they fail to understand that God created and designed us uh, to make choices. As a matter of fact, the eternal purpose of God is uh, to procure to himself a people who will love him by choice because, well, love must make a choice. And in eternity, God as supreme judge uh, of the universe will hold each of us, uh, both the lost, those who are outside of Christ and those who are saved that are in Christ, will hold each one of us uh, accountable for our choices. You could think of uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. It says, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, after death, the judgment. So to leave this world is to face God. Now, the truth, this truth is illustrated in our text passage. Uh, the, we see here in Deuteronomy chapter 30 that the Israelites, they're in Moab. That's east of the Dead Sea, the Transjordan area. They've wandered for 40 years in the wilderness under Moses' leadership. And they're soon to cross over Jordan and to enter the promised land. And sad to say, they're going to do that without Moses. Moses is not able to enter in because of a choice <laughs> that he made. And in Deuteronomy, uh, Moses is delivering his last words to this nation. And his words, oh, they're full of wisdom. They're full of instruction for the nation Israel as they are about to go where he can't, to go into God's promised land without him. So God delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. He puts, put before them uh, the prospect of a free and happy uh, future in the promised land. And all of this, all of this, however, uh, would not come automatically. You see, with, with privilege and blessing comes responsibility. And so God, through Moses, tells him that, that to gain the blessings uh, of that promised land, they had to make a choice. As a matter of fact, as we go this, through this uh, passage here in Deuteronomy, he tells them to choose life. It's very strong. Let's, let's look at it. Look at verse 15, Deuteronomy 30, 15. He says, see, he says, I have set before thee this day life and good, death and evil. So right here, Moses lays out the choices that they're facing before them very clearly. They can choose life and prosperity, or they can choose death and adversity. And uh, by the way, there's no middle ground here. Notice verse 16. He continues, In that I command thee this day to love uh, Yahweh thy Elohim, Lord, the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his, his commandments, his statutes, his judgments. Why? That thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So the order here of Moses' words, I think, are very, very uh, important in that he speaks first of Israel's commitment to love the Lord their God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's what he says. He's the very first thing. As you go into this land, keep your heart. As you go into this land, make sure you're, that, that God is number one in your life, that you love him supremely. And only after he states that, then he talks about keeping his ways and commandments. So keeping God's commandments follows and flows from a heart that loves him. And if you love someone, you try to please someone that desires to please from the heart. You see, it doesn't make any difference if the Old Covenant or the New, Old or New Testament. It's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. And so loving God means pleasing Him by keeping His ways, obeying 
his commandments. Jesus himself said, if you love me, if you love me, keep my commandments. Notice verse 17 and 18. Notice he says, but, and here we go, but if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish, and these shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou passest over Jordan to go it, to possess it. So Moses here has a warning. He warns the Israelites of the consequences of not keeping their hearts. The consequences of letting their hearts wander away from the Lord, which will eventually settle on the gods of the Canaanites. And sad to say, we know what took place in Israel. They never fully turned away from serving pagan gods. Never. They, they, they struggled, and this is the Old Testament, they struggled with idolatry all the way to the time of the Assyrian and the Babylonian uh, uh, captivity. Uh, the invasions upon Israel, north, first north to Israel, last uh, south to Judah. Uh, Israel didn't, as a consequence of that, letting their heart wander. Uh, Israel didn't remain uh, in their land. But no, we know they were taken captive. They were exiled uh, to a foreign land. And ultimately, a fa fateful remnant was allowed by the Lord to return and rebuild Jerusalem and to rebuild their temple. I'm, uh, I'm reading through the whole Jewish Bible. It's called the Complete Jewish Bible. And uh, the, in, that, in that translation, in the Jewish uh, Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, the canon's totally different. And so now they have me reading through Isaiah. And so it just so happens today I reached uh, chapter 40. And the sun came out in chapter 40, comfort ye my people. And so the first uh, 39 chapters are very dark, very dark about judgment, consequences of sin. And that's what we're talking about. But praise God, on chapter 40 on, uh, we, we find the restoration. And we have the promise of blessing. And so that's what we're seeing here. You know, yes, uh, you're, you're going to get tossed out of the land for poor choices. You, had to, you let your heart wander but one day you'll be able to come back. Verse 19 and 20, let's conclude this passage. Says, he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you. Look at this. He brings them back to this. I've set before you what? Life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. There you go. Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love Yahweh thy Elohim, that thou mayest obey his voice, that thou mayest cleave unto him. And I really love this. By the way, for he is your life. <laughs> and, and the length of days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. So Moses invokes heaven and earth. He, he invokes all creation to bear witness, to serve as witnesses. The, the Lord God through Moses has offered, set before Israel a clear choice. It's, it's, a, it's a choice between life and death. It, it's a choice between blessing and cursing. And if the Israelites fail to make the right choice, no one can say that Moses, their leader, didn't warn them. No one can accuse him of spiritual malpractice. Moses summarizes his call in clear and direct language, and he says emphatically, you know, and it's so strong. And it's such a needed message for us. Choose life. Choose life. Choose the Lord, for he is 
your life. What, is, what did Jesus say in John 10? The devil, uh, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I am, I am come that you might make, have life. And that you have abundant life. Choose life. Choose Jesus. You know, I mean, the need to choose life rests upon future generations of Israelites as well as they cross over into Canaan. Now, as we consider this passage, we realize that life is built upon the decisions we make every single day, every day. I mean, your choices and decisions ultimately determine your destiny. Uh, Moses had to tell the children of Israel to choose life. Well, you know why? Because uh, often their propensity, and just like us, just like us, their inclination was to choose death. There's a, there's a song we used to sing. Lord, uh, you know, I'm I prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And that's us. So as we are presently in this pandemic that, that clouds our nation, every voice of authority is constantly telling us to make good choices. Wrong choices could well result in choosing death. For ourselves and others. And I mean, daily they say, well, you know what they tell you to do. <laughs> you know, cough into your sleeve, uh, cover your mouth, uh, clean, wash your hands. All of these uh, social distancing and things like that. So we have a similar voice before us each day. How we choose uh, will determine what our immediate and far-reaching future will be. You have the power to choose the outcome of your life. And and I just want to say now, every day, and also think about this, in eternity, you possess the ability to make choices for yourself. You have the responsibility to make choices and to with that, like Adam and Eve and the Israelites, accept the consequences of your decisions. I mean, they say, well, that's Old Testament. Well, if you read Galatians, we reap what we sow. <laughs> Those are choices. We may say we're sowing, we're making choices. And so those are there for us, you see. No matter where you are in life or what your situation, there will always be choices to make. And sometimes we say to ourselves, well, you know, I really had no choice. No, no, no. You always have a choice. And I I think this is something we really need to to grasp tonight. For sure, there are powers that be, situations like we're living in today can restrict, take away many of our choices, and they have and they do. Yet, no matter how limited our choices may be, we can, no, we must make critical choices good choices for ourselves. There's still choices to make. Of all the choices we must make in this lifetime, the supreme choice, the most important choice, has to do with our eternity. I mean, while our bodies are temporal, yes, and one day, the Bible says this, often and all, you know, we'll return to dust. Our bodies will they come from the earth, they go back to the earth, we each also possess an eternal soul spirit that lives past death. And one day, every one of us, the Bible says, and I believe that we'll stand before God, we'll give an account for our lives, and especially for our sin. And on that day, the most important thing will not be so much what we've done as much as who we know, who we have chosen when it comes to eternity. So let's look at the choices. Take a moment, and we're going to move through this. The choices that we make. And here's the first and the most important. Choose Jesus. That's it. Choose to believe that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah, the promised Savior of the world. And of all of our decisions... Uh, one, the, one we, the one we make in this lifetime, this is the most important of all. This is the single most important 
Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, we know it well, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul was raised, think about Paul, he was raised in the tradition of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were a strict religious sect of Judaism that stressed on obtaining righteousness uh, or let me just say a right standing before God by keeping the law. But all of that changed when Paul met Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9. And, and realizing that on his best day, on his best day, Paul realized that he was a wicked sinner before a holy God and that Jesus was indeed the Savior who was crucified for his sins. And on and a moment of time, and, and it, it just shows it plainly there in Acts, Paul humbled himself before Jesus Christ. And he believed in him as the prophesied Messiah, as the Savior, his Savior. See, greater than your need for a surgical mask, greater for your need than hand sanitizer or a vaccine or a respirator, greater than that need is your need for a Savior. Jesus Christ. Physical death is but the beginning, just the beginning of our existence. And all you must do to enter eternity in hell is to do nothing. To not even make a choice. But, you know, even by your indifference, you make a choice. I mean, to choose Jesus, as, as uh, Moses would say, and we bring those words from Deuteronomy close here into our lives. To choose, choose Jesus is to choose life, which includes an existence with him throughout eternity. And once we choose Jesus as believers, we continue every day to make choices, to center our lives upon him. Peter tells us that we follow in his steps. And these choices have to do with our thoughts and our attitudes and our emotions and wills and our actions. And while all your choices as a believer certainly should be Holy Spirit led and empowered, you are the only person who can take charge of your thoughts, take charge of your attitudes and emotions and will and actions, really. Someone says that when someone gives you uh, lemons, make lemonade, you know. Choose, make a choice. There's always a choice to make. Choose to think positive thoughts. Choose to think, have a positive attitude that turns to a positive action. And life is measured not by what happens to us, but more how we respond what takes place or what happens to us. And, and this being true, that I, there are five more ways to choose life every day as believers. So having chosen Christ and knowing, by the way, knowing where you're going to spend eternity, having the Holy Spirit, all of these are helpful, but we still have choices to make every day. So here are some more choices uh, for the believer. Second, choose hope. I've talked about us as being a people of hope. Uh, choose to believe that everything will work out for your good and God's glory. Hope is foundational. It is foundational to positive thoughts, attitudes, and actions. Well, what is hope? Hope is faith in the future. It's the belief that the future will be brighter. Brighter than the past, you know. We, can, we get through the first 39 chapters of his, his Isaiah and, and the sun comes out in chapter 40. There's a, there's a better tomorrow for every child of God because of Jesus. And, and believe that good is stronger than evil. I mean, hope is the belief that things will work out even if the situation at the present time seems hopeless. 
I mean, hope is a choice you make based on your foundational belief that God is in control, that he is always working out his eternal purpose in our lives. And in our world, and we talked about this pandemic, and none, no one likes this, no one wants this, but, that, but we as Christians believe that God has a purpose always, 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 always. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we know it well. We know that all things, wow, even pandemics, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Uh, we're just days away from Easter. Now, whether we'll be able... <laughs> Whether we'll be able to get, be together as a church family on that day or not, I don't know. But we know that Easter, the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, victory over death, hallelujah, victory over the grave. And because of the resurrection, Christians are people characterized by hope. You know, we are. Hope chooses a positive outlook that will carry you through the dark hours and the dark time. Because the tomb is empty, because we're assured of one day our own resurrection, we're assured to be absent because of the resurrection from this body to be present with the Lord. Because of all of that, we have hope. No matter what the circumstances are, choose hope, make a choice. That God's got a purpose, and it's for your good, and it's for His glory. Second, choose gratitude. Choose gratitude. Choose to count your blessings. Now, Paul, in, uh, quoting him a lot, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.18, and everything, it's a big, wide-open word, everything, <laughs> give thanks. Why? Well, this is God's will for you. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Concerning you, so the opposite of gratitude is a is a is an attitude of entitlement. Entitlement says I deserve it. You know, let me just say this: the most happy, successful people are keenly aware that life and everything in it is undeserved. It's all grace. I mean, we're people of grace, and God's grace is wonderful, and has so rich in our lives. They see themselves as blessed. These are Christians, don't you think? They see themselves as fortunate. And just as people can have hope when, when things are not so hopeful, things are not going well, well, you know what? We can be grateful, even though it seems like we possess so little. You know, often I tell you, as your pastor, you've got a, in your mind, you've got a, a ledger. You know, a yellow pad, and you know, you draw a line, and you've got things that are not so good, and you got, you know, things that are good that are going well, and you have a choice as to which you focus on. It's not that you don't focus on the list of problems; you just pencil in hope. You pencil in hope, but God, but God, but God. Oh yeah, this is wrong, but God. This is a need, but God. I don't know how I'm going to pay, but listen. But God, so hope on the negative side. And then focus on the good things and just count your blessings, you know? Gratitude begins with seeing yourself as blessed. And that's a choice you alone can make. And this choice matters because the attitude of gratitude is the single most important factor in shaping how you feel about your life. Grateful people are a delight to be around because they're constantly thanking and praising God and others, you know? that They're grateful for the help they receive, even in the small ways, and they're more likely to express thanks. I, I, I'll give a badge to my mother-in-law who's with the Lord, but the amazing thing about my mother-in-law, Sister Kitch, is that she could rejoice in the small things. I mean, the sunlight. Aren't we thankful that the sun, you know, it's always been shining, but we could see it today. And, you know, the clouds broke away. And, and my goodness, it just feels great. Thank you, Lord, for the sunshine. Thank you, Lord, for a bright and sunny day that you've given me. And so count your blessings 
and you'll be blessed. Gratitude is good for the soul. So every day choose hope. Every day choose gratitude. Here's the fourth. Choose compassion. Always be kind to everyone you meet. Choose compassion. We, we will revisit that, you know. We're made in the likeness and the image of God. All humanity bears God's image. And so put it down. And you know what I'm about to say. Every human being is worthy of dignity and respect and honor. And can I add to that? Kindness. Right. Kindness. I mean, compassion means treating others with gentleness and respect, even, <laughs> even when you feel they don't deserve it. And by the way, what do you deserve? I mean, compassion means to be patient, tolerant, helpful to others. Compassion is the natural byproduct of what Paul speaks of. In Galatians chapter 5, verse uh, 22 and 23, as the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit singular. All of this. I mean, it, you get when you were saved, you get the Holy Spirit, and you get all of Him when you're saved. He lives inside. He abides in you. Abides in. And when He comes, you get all of Him and the fruit. And so what is that fruit? Love, joy, peace, <laughs> suffering, uh, long-suffering, forbearance, you know, gentleness, kindness, Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control. Against such there is all, all law. So all of that, all of that is wrapped up in compassion. Make a choice. Choose life. Choose compassion. Choose kindness. Wow, it's really prime time for that. I know we're brief exposure outside our home, but we go to the grocery store or whatever. Someone might a little bit be a little bit more anxious than you and pushed by you or what you know what i have found just the opposite I, what little time i've been out at, at, around I, I have found people for the most part are very very kind and i think that's just wonderful um, choose kindness make the decision to treat others with kindness with gentleness with respect especially and more more so when the, it's, it's a challenge in his sense. Well, I can't do that. Well, if you're saved, if you've chosen Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, you have his fruit, you have his power, you can through him. So choose compassion. And then, fifth, choose generosity. Choose to give more than you receive. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, Jean Autry. She's, she's just praising uh, so many members of Rogers Baptist Church who are shopping for others and checking on them. And, and you know, that's just a great thing. Think beyond yourself. Think of others. Choose generosity. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, we're instructed to remember Jesus' words. It says that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so generosity begins with the belief that life is and everything in it is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. So determine to be generous with what? Well, everything. Generous with your time. Generous with hospitality. Generous with your ideas, your opportunities, your encouragement. I mean, the, the, the choice to be generous, Jesus says, opens the door to blessing. He said, you know, the more, the more generous you are, the more giving you are, the more you're going to be blessed, the more you're going to receive. And we give to others, Jesus is saying, we get more in return than hoarding or just thinking of ourselves. Givers are blessed. And so what a great opportunity that we have. This is really prime time for these choose life decisions. And especially now, I mean, it's always right, but especially now. And it is our choice. Here's number six and the last. Choose joy. Choose to celebrate the life God has given you. And amid the uh, uh, coronavirus crisis, some people in uh, Cache County, Utah, uh, I saw the other day, found a way to spread joy. The people were putting up clotheslines 
uh, instead of hanging their laundry on the clothesline, they would, it was seen in the highway, they, they were hanging messages of hope <laughs> for everyone to read and encouragement. Well, the idea is to inspire and remind everyone that uh, we're all in this together, even in troubling times. In difficult times, people need positivity, not negativity. And joy is just that. It's positive. I mean, you think about Paul and uh, from a prison cell in Rome. Uh, he writes in Philippians 4.4, 4, uh, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So you know, what is he telling us? And I think that's a great verse. There's a lot of happiness, joy verses in the Bible, Old and New Testament. There are just so many. But I thought of this one because happiness and joy is focused on the Lord, that's focused on the Lord, doesn't rise and fall with circumstances. It's, it's just steadfast because it's in Him. Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord, of the Lord is our strength. Joyful people are both attractive to other people and, by the way, attract people to you. You know, you know being a grouch and being negative, push people away, but choosing to be joyful and ask God for that, that joy of the heart to come forth, uh, joy of, of Lord uh, to be evident in your life is an attractive thing. It draws. And by the way, joy is contagious. It is contagious. We've all have someone whose laugh makes, you can't hear someone laugh without yourself laughing. And, and joy is that way. I, I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. Joy is the serious business of heaven. Choose to be a Tigger, not an Eeyore, I guess. So <laughs> whatever you're facing today, just remember you have choices. You have choices. You may not be able to choose what someone else has uh, denied you or done to you, but you can choose how you respond to what's taken place, what God has allowed. And, and that's how I look at it. Now, I suffer enough for my own choices, that's for sure. But God allows things, and I always tell myself, there is nothing comes into my life that first didn't come by God, and that He has at least allowed into my life. And uh, this coronavirus is something that God has allowed to, 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 to visit us. If we know the consequences of a sinful world, all of those things we can talk about. So in this situation, let's hear Moses' challenge. Choose life. Choose life. I mean, a life with Jesus brings fresh hope and gratitude and compassion, generosity and joy in every day. It'll make our days of confinement pass much faster. Choose life with Jesus, not the dead responses of pessimism and hopelessness. No. We are people of faith. We're people of hope. We are the people of the empty tomb. We are the children of the resurrection. And you know, the resurrection is the most central truth in Christianity. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ isn't risen, our, our hope is in vain. Our, our, our faith is in vain, but it's not. Christ is the risen. And so our hope is alive. Our faith is alive. Our joy is alive. Live with Jesus. Live, life with Jesus breathes oxygen into your life and into our world. Wow, how, how wonderful that we've got this Bible and uh, Old and New Testaments and it's alive and it's powerful even for today. And Moses' words to us that are Deuteronomy, so fitting, verses 15 through 20. So the challenge he sets before Israel, really God sets before us every day. So God help us to live it out. Help us. Lights on, let it in, and live it out. And that is before us. God bless us. May we have encouragement tonight. 
by being in God's Word, by being together the best way we can. And uh, God bless you. And uh, we'll see you Sunday morning, Lord willing. Uh, we'll live stream Sunday morning, get the Word out, and uh, make good choices. God bless you.